Land's End Coast Guard, Lowe's in. Land's End Coast Guard. Union Star, Union Star, come on, Land's End Coast Guard. Union Star, this is some of you, see, I'm over. Yes, we are. Uh, approximately now, eight miles east of Wolf Rock. Uh, engines have stopped, and we are unable to get them started at the moment. 25 years ago, a cargo ship called the Union Star suffered engine failure off the coast of Cornwall. In hurricane winds and 60-foot waves, the Penley lifeboat set forth to try and rescue the ship's crew. Eight men, all volunteers, made the ultimate sacrifice in one of the greatest disasters in lifeboat history. I look back on it and I see those men on the rails and the efforts they did in the rocks. And you, you can't imagine the, the bravery of people like that. Despite the fact it's 25 years, you know, she went out and she's still out. And there's that gap in, in people's lives and, and feelings that I think will never go away while the people are alive who, who experienced it. You know, I used to long as a journalist that I would get a world exclusive I got my wish, but it broke my heart. In the far south of Cornwall, just a few miles from Land's End, lies a place called Mausel. The events that happened here 25 years ago changed this small village forever, scarring the lives of those left behind. In 1981, Mausel was a close-knit fishing community, at the heart of which was the Penley lifeboat. Based a mile from Mausel off Penley Point, she was called the Solomon Brown, and she was the pride and joy of the village. The Solomon Brown was a, a wooden Watson-class lifeboat. Uh, we were quite pleased with her because she'd been recently refitted and we thought that she was the state-of-the-art boat. Um, but it was a class of boat that was stationed all around the country. When I was growing up, the lifeboat was a big part of the village. Mauser was just starting to become a tourist village. It's more, there's, you know, more locals living here, and it's just something you always wanted to do. I always wanted to be on the lifeboat. Because I remember I used to run it when I was a child and help them scrub it down and things like that. Most of the crew were born and bred in Mauser. Many of them were fishermen, and they were all devoted volunteers. They were led by the coxswain Trevelyan Richards. You're still getting the family element in lifeboat crews, fathers, sons and grandsons and that sort of yes, thing? Yes, yes, we've got one or two of them here in our present crew. Where do they come from in the main? What sort of profession are they? Well, they're mostly fishermen and they come to the same village as what I do. And uh, if they're not fishermen, they have connections with the sea. So I'm, I'm pretty lucky in a way here that I've got a crew like they are. Trevelyan was a good coxswain. He was a character in his way and uh, sat in his ways, uh, a fisherman all his life. So I think we ought to establish, right, although you are the coxswain, you've got a full-time job as a trawler skipper, haven't That's you? That's right, yes. Uh, this is just a part-time job. I think he was in the home guard as a, when the war was on, but uh, as a coxswain, he was an extremely nice man. I think in every community, you always get a nucleus of people. They all stand above the rest in what they do because they they can take any flack from anyone and they don't really care, you know. And they'll always march on to what they think is true. Um, I think Trevelyan's up in the top notch with them. Nobody would contradict him, you know. He, he was the boss. He was a hell of a character as well, you know. He could be quite hard on them or he could be really, you know, I mean, they, were, they could be pretty wild at times. They knew how to have fun. On the night of the 19th of December, 1981, Mausel was all set for Christmas. 
The village had a unique way of marking the festive season. Christmas is a big thing in Mosul. I mean, we have the local Christmas lights on every year, and it is a big celebration. We have a, a, a thing called Tom Bocock's Eve, which is the, the day before Christmas Eve, so it's the 23rd of December, when all the local fishermen and seamen get together and have a, well, like a great big party, if you like, really. It's, it's good, and it's, it was a big thing in Mosul. Everybody was drinking, laughing, joking. The darts had just started, I think. I'd just done the draw for that, and everyone was laughing and saying, cool, how would you come to pick me out against so-and-so, like, you know? Whilst people were enjoying themselves, outside, the weather was gradually deteriorating. It had gone from a high wind to this extraordinarily screaming wild gale in a very, very short time. Um, it had a, a, a sort of strange note in the wind, and I'm not making this up, it really did. It was, it was a screaming sort of noise, which I'd never heard of. As the weather worsened, out at sea, the Union Star was struggling with engine failure. That is correct, and there are eight people aboard. Eight people, I repeat. Roger, eight persons on board. What type of vessel are you, please, Union Star? We are a coaster. On duty that night to receive the calls was Colin Sturman. Well, the Union Star told us um, just after six o'clock that he had an engine problem, which in itself is not unusual. We have ships call us with engine problems uh, several times a week even today. Um, but he said that uh, obviously the weather conditions were bad and he was concerned that if uh, he couldn't get his engine started that they would be in difficulty. Our intentions are at the moment, we want to get the main engine started, but if we cannot get the main engine started, we'll have to take everybody off and get a tug or someone to tow us in. The Union Star was on her maiden voyage carrying fertilizer from Holland to Ireland. It was one of a fleet of, of coasters um, built by Union Transport who were having a very successful time. It was a good model because it was fit for work in coastal waters. It was very low profile and so it could go up under the bridges of, of the, the big rivers in Europe and uh, they built four of them actually at about a million pounds apiece. The Union Star was, was the latest one. The skipper of this brand new boat was Henry Morton. Happy go lucky type of guy. Um, very professional and uh, straight down the line, really. He didn't take any messing off anybody. And um, he was, I don't know, um, a pleasant enough guy, really, I suppose. I spoke to him in the morning about 10 o'clock and um, he said everything was going all right. And I asked him when he'd be around the corner. We, we called Land's End the corner. He said about uh, just after tea and um, then he'd be running away with the weather towards Arklow and he seemed quite happy. And I asked him what the weather was like and they told me that it was suddenly about force five but uh, it was forecast to deteriorate during the day and he told me that the ship was handling it quite well, it was rolling a bit. But by early evening, the situation was very different. Yeah, we're just slowly drifting in towards the land at the moment. We're trying to start the engine, and uh, if we get it underway and we get clear, uh, we'll let him know. Over. Uh, thank you, Thank you very much. Worried how far the Union Star might be drifting, the Coast Guard sent one of their local officers to a lookout point, just along the coast from Mausel. I got a call from Falmouth to say that uh, there's a vessel in trouble near the wolf and would I start the radar up and put a radar plot on to positively identify the position. By the time I got up here and, and put a, a marker on him on the radar, he drifted some to the north. 
the Union Star was heading straight towards the treacherous coastline. If you come ashore on this coast, you've got very little chance of getting off and you break up quite quickly. You imagine a yacht coming ashore on any of these points uh, in even weather like this and it'll go down very quickly. In Mausel, the Penley lifeboat was put on standby. Two of the crew members waiting for the call were Nigel Brockman and his son Neil. My dad was a second or assistant mechanic, he was known as Ed, and he would have been in charge of the radios and the radar and do a bit of navigating and stuff like that. What kind of equipment do you carry, Nigel? Oh, well, we got radar, big master set with the Woodson Clipper, and the Westminster is VHF. What range? So, what's your range? Uh, <laughs> Most people knew my father. He could never be serious about anything. He was always joking around. He was like the well, the joker in the pack. If anything stupid was happening, he'd be in the middle doing it, you know. So, and I, well, I know it's, I've never heard anyone say a bad word about him. Never. Everyone I, I've ever spoke to or come up to, people I don't even know, come up to me and said they knew my father, which I like. You know, and they say how, how much, you know, how much they admired him and liked him. A salvage tug was contacted to tow the stricken Union Star. But this would involve paying salvage costs as part of a contract called a Lloyd's Open Form. So Morton declined the offer. Station calling Union Star. The Union Star, Falmouth Coast Guard, over. Oh, Falmouth Coast Guard, yes, Union Star. Yes, I gather you've had a word with the skipper of the uh, salvage tug North Holland, over. Yes, I had a word with him. All he's interested in is the money at the moment. When he, he was talking to the tug captain very early on, and the tug captain said, shall I come out? And he said, yes, come out and stand by. And so the tug captain said, well, will you accept Lloyd's open form? And he said, obviously, you know, it's a bit early to, to, to make a commitment to do that. News that the lifeboat might be needed began to spread throughout Mausel. One of the youngest volunteers was merchant seaman Kevin Smith, who happened to be home for Christmas. Loved the sea, the sea was in his blood. He always, to me, seemed to be like a free spirit. He'd go off to sea, you never quite know when he was coming back, and he'd come back and it was like a breath of fresh air blowing through the village. Well, Kevin was my uh, brother-in-law uh, at the time. Um, I sailed with Kevin many times when I was fishing. A great bloke, a bit fun, anything goes really, you know. Uh, has a, bit of a massive zest for life. Six years earlier, the Solomon Brown had taken part in the rescue of a sinking ship called the Lovett. Kevin was a crew member, even though he'd only been a teenager at the time. Hey, you, I know, were on the Lovett rescue, weren't you? Yeah. And that was that was not very pleasant. No, that's, I was uh, 75, I think. And you were very young. Yeah. In fact, I believe you were too young to have been there officially. So they told me so. Yeah. Kevin was very young, 15, 16. He'd actually fabricated his age to get on the boat at that point, and went out on the Lovett rescue and was pulling men out of the sea that were younger than him. And he was awarded on vellum for that. Very, very brave thing to have done. You didn't, did you enjoy it? Well, you wouldn't have chosen a damn full question, but um, you'll remember it, I imagine. Oh, yeah, I always remember it, yeah. Very unpleasant. Yeah, I always remember it. The Penley crew had to pull several dead bodies out of the water. They were all honoured by the RNLI for their role in the rescue. Like the most of the crew, wasn't a lot of speaking going on board the boat. I think it was all sort of choked up with it, you know. 
But uh, I think what upset the crew most of all was when they took a youngster aboard, yeah. 16. Yeah. You know, I'll admit it was a bad job. Every five men lose their lives of what we had. But when you get a youngster at 16, no, everything you look forward to and life's not there to look at, no? It was a southerly wind gusting up to force 11, which is hurricane force. Even the broken waves, when they hit the cliff, were some 30 foot in, in height. So I've never seen sea conditions as bad as that, and I've never seen them since. tanks is full of water. Well, at the moment we're trying to use our starboard tank and we're hoping that one is okay. Could you give us a light on the helicopter, please? Yeah, just taxiing now. We should be able bomb shortly, haven't we? Okay, thank you very much. We'll be able to bomb shortly. With water in the fuel tank, it was now impossible to restart the engines of the Union Star and a helicopter was needed. The pilot who would communicate with Morton was Russell Smith, an American who was in England on a naval exchange program. When we first set off, it was only about 30, 40 knots of wind, maybe a little more. Not all that bad, really. But as we proceeded to the scene, uh, the weather worsened significantly, very rapidly, and, uh, and we could tell this can be a full gale very shortly. Uh, yes, uh, Union Star. Union Star, yes, sir. 05, sir. 05, mate, okay, thank you very much. I'll have a hand flare around standing by for you. Helicopter Union Star, did you stop, Hoffler? Union Star, let's go. Initially, the position was given as eight miles east of Wolf Rock, which put her about six miles south of um, Tatadu Lighthouse. Uh, when we identified uh, the correct position uh, with the helicopter from the flare, she was only about two, two and a half miles off the coast, which um, made things um, significantly different from a response point of view. With the Union Star so close to shore, the Penley lifeboat was asked to launch. The launch crew that night were Dudley Penrose and Raymond Pomeroy. It was their job to launch the lifeboat safely. Don't seem like 25 years ago. No, no. No, no brave men. Brave men. I know that. You know, the one A lot of people wouldn't have gone that night, I know. <laughs> no. The first I knew that the lifeboat was wanted. I knew it was a terrible night. We all knew that. It was a terrible day in the making. Uh, the first I heard of it was the coxswain's wife, Trevelyan's mother. Trevelyan's mother phoned me to say that the boat was wanted. And that was about 10 to 8 in that evening. When the maroons were heard, all the crew stopped what they were doing and rushed to the lifeboat station. One of those was 33-year-old Barry Tory, a fisherman who was married with two young sons. Barry was just a crew member. Uh, he'd been on there a long, long time. Um, not sure how old he was when he first went, um, but just a teenager, I think. Um, it's just part of his life, part of his upbringing, just always been at sea. We'd planned to go out and we had a babysitter organised. Then the shout went out that they were going. Barry went and said, I'll see you later. Then I was kind of trying to decide, well, shall I just wait here or shall I, you know, go out because we were meeting some friends. So I, I went out uh, with these friends and uh, we were only in the village. He knew where I was and um, just sort of waited.
More than a dozen men responded to the call, but only eight were needed. Trevelyan chose the best crew he had for that job, the ones he knew could do that job, the ones he could trust, or not trust, the, the best hands he had, the best crewmen he had for that job. He wanted his most experienced crew that night because it was a hellish night, really, you know, he knew it was going to be tough. Trevelyan took Barry Torrey, Kevin Smith, Nigel Brockman, and the lifeboat mechanic. Stephen Madron. He also chose Charlie Greenoff, the landlord of the local pub, John Blewett, and the 22 year old Gary Wallace. The eight were selected for their skill and experience, but none could have predicted the outcome of that terrible night. The crew were all there, all dressed which was really, you know, unusual for us because uh, lifeboat men dress for the occasion, but everybody was dressed properly that night. I always remember Trevelyan helping Barry, Barry Torrey with his life jacket because Barry didn't like wearing life jackets and uh, uh, he wouldn't wear one as a rule, but uh, that night he had to put one on and uh, Trevelyan had to show him and help him on with it, you know. All the crew were around the stern of the lifeboat. You used to always stand around the stern when they lunched. And uh, that night Trevelyan got them all inside because it was such a, such a bad night, you know, with the sea and the spray breaking all right over the lifeboat after they put the mast up because the exhaust went up the mast <clears throat> and you had to put the mast up to uh, you know before you start the engines up at only 17 neil was too young but trevelyan was also keen not to take two members of the same family i was absolutely gutted because i never went i was upset because i never because i wasn't asked to go and I got to say, the boat was launched. I've never seen a piece of seamanship like that. To get that boat, people don't realize what the weather was like that night. To get that boat in the water was some piece of seamanship. We waited and waited and waited well, a few, quite a few minutes to catch the right moment to knock her off a slip. She went down, the sea hit the bottom of the slip, and she went down behind the next one and was gone. But when we closed the doors up that night, Raymond and myself were the last two to leave the boathouse, and the wind was whistling through the rafters, an awful eerie feeling and there was always that suspicion it wasn't a very good, it would be a very good night. Power Coast Guard, Power Coast Guard, Power Coast Guard, this is the friendly lifeboat. Friendly lifeboat calling Power Coast Guard. Please, please, over. Uh, friendly lifeboat, Thomas Coast Guard, you're loud and clear, over. Uh, Thomas Coast Guard, yes, um, we are afloat now, we have now launched. And proceed into Flutter, over. A 47-foot boat is um, about the, uh, the size of a, of a decent yacht nowadays. And as soon as they went down the slip, they were, they were in very rough seas. And they would have been completely awash. The decks would have been awash. And even the after cabin, water used to slosh around in it because of its self-draining situation. So life on board, even without going on deck, um, would have been um, quite horrendous. You'd have breaking seas breaking over the boat. The boat would be rolling all the time, pitching. Forward, back, up and down. Like being, on in, a, well, like being in a washing machine, I suppose is the best way to describe it. 
the Solomon Brown, you had to, you had to physically drive around. You had to like work the engines, spin the wheels. It had been very hard to control that boat. As Trevelyan confirmed that the lifeboat had set off, the helicopter was already on the scene. The ocean was uh, very confused and, and getting worse. And uh, the casualty was on scene, bouncing significantly, rolling uh, in the sea. Well, they only had their navigation lights when they first came on scene. And we were attempting to effect a rescue at that point. And, uh, and then he put his anchor out and turned bow into the sea. And we asked him at that point, would he mind putting on his, his uh, you know, turn on some more lights so we could see the boat better and, and uh, position ourselves better and, and such. Because it was black night. We couldn't see a thing. We couldn't see where the boat was moving very much. And so he turned on all his floodlights. We asked the crew if uh, they wanted to come off, and initially they were sorting out, uh, trying to start the engines. And, uh, and then from that point, as the weather was worsening and they were drifting toward the coast and, and uh, we were trying to get their attention that that was happening fairly quickly, uh, they then decided to remove uh, the woman and two children. And that was our first surprise with the, there was a woman and two children on board. How many people do you plan on transferring? Uh, one woman and two children, are there? Sorry, say again. One woman and two children, are there? Sorry, say again. One woman and uh, two children, the crew will remain aboard until, uh, until the last, are there? Yeah, confirm one woman and two children. Yes, that's correct. The woman was Morton's wife, Dawn. The children were his stepdaughters. He'd picked them up en route so that they'd be together for Christmas. Dawn's children came over from South Africa and they were going to stay in England and uh, that's why the reason why the girls were on board. I think it, it, it possibly had an effect on the thinking of the captain, certainly, because he would obviously um, have this emotional... Um, issue to deal with. It's bad enough just um, having to look after the crew, let alone your wife and um, two young girls who have probably never been on the ship before and then probably only been a couple of days on board the ship. They may have been seasick during, uh, during the passage. So um, it would have been very difficult. And another thing that I don't think is very well known that um, Dawn was actually pregnant at the time. The wind was now freshening, probably well, at least 60 mile an hour, uh, probably more. The waves at that point were about 50 foot seas, and it was getting more difficult. There were times we had to uh, rapidly change our position because the ship was coming up and uh, higher than we expected. And uh, there were a couple of times that came very close to our, our rotors of the helicopter. If that happened, uh, it would break the rotors, we wouldn't be here. And uh, so we, we had to adjust a, a number of times uh, because the ship would suddenly pitch much more violently than, than was expected. Star, this is uh, Rescue 80, how do you read? Uh, Rescue 80, yes, loud and clear. We tried lowering the, the crewman, the ship was sideways to the, to the waves and such, and the confused sea, and it was rolling significantly and pitching. 
and it was difficult getting uh, our crewmen down. My concentration was on the deck that I was trying to get to. I'm at this stage not in communication with the aircraft. Uh, I'm at their, uh, their, in their hands and they're trying to put me onto that deck. And I, I do recall how very clean and uh, new the green painted deck looked. And I remember focusing on this piece of green deck and they brought the first lady out and uh, one of the men was effectively holding her against the bulkhead uh, standing on this deck and I was focused on the deck and she'd got these these bright pink court shoes on um, I, I, I couldn't tell you anything else about her but looking at that piece of deck where I was aiming uh, this is an, an enduring memory of these bright pink court shoes which was so incongruous in that, uh, that violent uh, situation Roger, Union Star, this is looking too difficult for Rescue 80 as far as safety is concerned. We're getting very close to your map and we don't have a long enough high line. The dreadful conditions have made a helicopter rescue too dangerous. The Union Star was less than a mile from the shore and her fate now rested on the efforts of Trevelyan and his crew. Friendly lifeboat, Union Star, yes, loud and clear, over. Do you want for us to come alongside and take the women and children, over? Uh, yes, please, yeah, if uh, so that the uh, helicopter's having a bit of difficulty getting uh, getting to us, so uh, if you could pop out and uh, get the women uh, and, the, uh, well, the two children and the woman off, I'd be very much obliged, over. It's like the old saying that women and children first, but I think it still holds now. I think you would go for women and children first, and you and it would make a difference. Although you're there to save any life is precious. That's what we're. That's what we do for a living. We save lives. We if we think we can save someone, we'll save someone. We've got four shackles of cable out. We've already lost one anchor. We've got four shackles of cable out trying to hold our position. Roger. With the helicopter standing by. The Penley lifeboat fought to come alongside the Union Star. Yes, that's a good news, John. Yes, uh, message from our coxswain that uh, he, he advises you for everybody to come off. Over. Yes, we're all coming off. When we pulled off to let the, the lifeboat go in, they were now pretty well into the shallows and into the very severe breaking seas. Um, and we effectively sat and watched whilst they tried to effect that, uh, that rescue. You could see the Solomon Brown being bashed up against the side of the Union Star and, and the crew standing on the rail and, and uh, reaching out trying to grab the ship, throwing lines over like the grappling hooks to try and pull themselves alongside and steady themselves. The anchor was down and the anchor was holding her, but the anchor wasn't holding her steady. I don't think he really realized how quickly he was drifting toward the rocks. And that lifeboat, special eight zero, I go at 300 yards from the coast. The breakers are quite large out here and the lifeboat is having trouble getting alongside. The spray and the, and the green water, as I would call it, were, were uh, crashing up against the wheelhouse and it was getting very difficult. and now we're looking at 60, maybe 70 foot uh, waves. I can imagine how they probably felt on board because I'm sure it was shaking the ship and violently, uh, and the risk of coming outside would have been uh, tremendous because uh, you don't know when in the dark sea and in the, in the rain when the next wave is coming. As it eventually went right into the surf, then the Union Star did start to roll very seriously. Um, I, I would think you know, in excess of 50 degrees. Uh, and at one stage, um, I did see the uh, Solomon Brown, the lifeboat, literally 
alongside the Union Star and as she rolled the lifeboat came up on her side so she was effectively out of the water. Stanley lifeboat, we're estimating uh, 10 minutes before they hit the beach. Did you say 10 minutes before the beach, Noah? About 10 minutes before they drift into the beach. We should go on that rapidly. The Solomon Brown came in bow to bow to the Union Star and as it was in the rocks. And I thought, this is incredible. What's he doing in the rocks? There really wasn't much room to maneuver. And the wind was gusting so violently. It was like being between two big boxing bags, you know, being thrashed about. A local journalist made his way down to the cliffs overlooking the scene. When I first arrived on the, on the cliff, I could see the helicopter and I could see the Union Star being battered in the waves and I could see the lifeboat. And it was from there that I watched the whole incident unfold. Uh, Union, uh, Union Star, uh, yeah, we're going to make a tent here to get alongside at the moment. Okay, skip, yep. Yeah. Trevelyan Richards, he was doing a superb job in absolutely atrocious conditions. The way he positioned and got himself over those very, very steep uh, ways, in that sense almost slowing it over, because you don't go straight. And the way he was uh, putting it was tremendous seaman, tremendous seamanship. And all of a sudden, there's a huge wave. I would think that the height of the wave was probably 50 to 60 feet high. The lifeboat crew obviously saw this. They went astern quite hard, and I could see that from the cliff. They very nearly got over the crest of the wave, but the crest of the wave picked the lifeboat up and dropped the lifeboat across the deck of the Union Star. Solomon Brown went up onto the Union Star and uh, was well off the water at that point and I thought they were all going to go over together at that point. But after sliding off the deck of the Union Star, the lifeboat managed almost immediately to get back alongside. In the dark, because it's very dark, you see shadows of people running out of the wheelhouse. And it appeared they were just jumping to the lifeboat. And the lifeboat crew is out with their, their arms out, you know, to catch them. Several people, looked like about five to us, ran out and jumped across to the Solomon Brown. They were, were wearing their bright fluorescent orange uh, life jackets. So they were relatively easy to spot as they seemed to pass from one vessel to the other. And then uh, before the next breaker came in, they turned to seaward and, and uh, in among all these rocks, and I don't see how they actually made it a turn to get to seaward. And, and this huge wave came in and they went underneath it and disappeared and surfaced on the other side, basically, like a submarine. And we assumed at that point that he was going to continue going out to sea and head home. Coast Guard rescue is here. I'm going to have to haul off. We're uh, dangerously close with our tail into the coast. Uh, do you intend returning to the station or are you going to stand off offshore? Over? Well, I can't do much uh, once they reach the cliff. We broke it off at that point and f feeling that we had done all that we could do. And we assumed that the Solomon Brown had had made the same decision, and uh, we're going to, con you know, return to home. But the crew of the Solomon Brown hadn't made the same decision. They were about to make one final rescue attempt.
it's a devastating feeling when you hear that call and the call and the call and nobody answers. It's just, it gives you that very, very hollow, sick feeling in your stomach. Unfortunately, on the way back, uh, one of the first things the people asked when we arrived, as we're listening to people calling to Solomon Brown, uh, they said, have you heard from Solomon Brown? And you get that very terrible sinking feeling that something's gone wrong, terribly wrong. So we uh, refueled, uh, rinsed the engines with fresh water to clean up as much of the salt as we could and uh, launched again. In Mausel, Barry's wife, Lynn, was unaware of any problem with the lifeboat. I don't really remember thinking anything disastrous was going to happen. So, you know, came home at some point in the evening and made sure the boys were fast asleep and went to bed. Which is, you know, was quite normal. Um, because if they went out on a, on a shout, you, you didn't know what time they were coming back. I didn't have a radio. I know a lot of uh, wives would listen in, but we didn't have one set up and uh, just assumed they'd be back. There was a brief glimmer of hope when someone claimed they could see the lights of the Solomon Brown. We continued to call the, the lifeboat. About three quarters of an hour later, the, the auxiliary lookout at Penza Point called in and, and reported seeing the lifeboat coming back to uh, Newley. So we, th we were quite heartened by that. We told the launching authority to expect them in Newley. And a whole bunch of people went down to Newlyn to meet her. And of course she never turned up. Nobody, nobody knows to this day what those lights were or why they were seen. Don Buckfield made his way to the scene with a coastal rescue team. They could see the Union Star on its side, just below the cliffs. There was wreckage washing up and down with the waves, and I saw a life jacket with the, with the light still working. And uh, on reaching the top of the cliff again, we'd become aware that uh, Falmouth was concerned for the lifeboat. And at that time, I could almost definitely say that that was a lifeboat jacket in the water. The discovery of the life jacket confirmed that the worst had happened. The Penley lifeboat and the Union Star had been wrecked. A friend of mine, who I'd been out with, a girlfriend, came knocking on the door, I, can't, I don't even know what time it was, and said uh, something's, something bad's happened to the lifeboat. And um, don't really, I don't really think much registered after that. Um, you know, I couldn't say anything specific because it was all just, uh, I just remember lots of people all the time thinking, we should all be quiet. You wake the children up, you know? And I told them straight away, as soon as they woke up the next day, that their daddy wasn't coming home. For Kevin's family, it was his brother who brought the devastating news. I can remember him coming into his mother's front room and I've never seen grief like it. 
There is no grief that can compare to a mother losing her child. And Pat was a very, very, very strong woman. And what an awful thing for anyone to have to do. It's like now I can see it's playing back in my head like a video. I knew just the disbelief and the shock. It was just such a sad time. <laughs> By first light, search parties continued to look for wreckage. Many of those searching included family and friends. Personally, I was out searching for 10 days. Well, I think it was the fact that I was going to find Kevin alive, I suppose. So I just really kept searching, really thinking, again, it's a futile search, but something in you said, you've got to keep going. Hoping that you will find someone, you know. We started to find bits and pieces of bodies. Once that happened, you knew, knew that was it, really. Yeah, we only found one whole body. And that was Nigel's, my mate's. In the end, only eight bodies were recovered. Four from the Solomon Brown, and four from the Union Star. You live and do your job, and live to do it again. And, uh, and when some of your own are taken, it hurts. It hurts deeply. You can't imagine the the bravery of people like that. You know, it's just to put their life on the line. You know, they're the salt of, of the earth. You know, they're the the fathers, the brothers, the sons. The sons of Mausel. Things like Christmas Eve, we was burying Trevelyan in the morning, my father in the afternoon, and the box day we had more funerals. It was it was hard going. You weren't allowed your own private grief. Um, everything you did was noticed. Everything you said was written. So it was very, very difficult. You know, just going out of the house was impossible. The ashes of Dawn and one of her daughters were scattered out at sea close to where the Union Star was wrecked. Dawn's other daughter and Henry Morton were never found. My mother took it very badly. She couldn't really accept it, particularly with um, Mick's body not being found. I don't think she ever accepted it till the day she died that he was uh, actually lost. I think she believed he was suffering from amnesia and was wandering around. The, um, the West Country somewhere, and one day he would come back and knock on the door.
Fifteen months later, there was a formal inquiry into exactly what happened. It raised questions about Morton's actions and the decisions he made that night. It was very difficult. You know, I'd have preferred to have been able to speak to some of the people, um, families from the lifeboat, but um, uh, I don't know, it was a very difficult position for me to be in at the time, particularly with all the criticism was going on, etc. And um, I, I found it very hard. His only crime, as far as I know, he was a little overconfident about how fast he was drifting into the land. He was drifting into land a lot faster than he thought he was. Um, and I think he was slightly on the optimistic side about, about that. One of the issues examined was why Morton declined the salvage tow when it was first offered. And when they suddenly decided they wanted a tow, it was too late because the, the tug couldn't, couldn't get in. It was too shallow for the tow to get in to put a line on. They should have been forced to take a tow hours before she even got anywhere near the shore. Now the rules have changed somewhat and the Coast Guard can initiate a May Day on behalf of uh, a ship's master and indeed we have the powers to uh, require a ship's master to take a tow if that's what we deem appropriate. Um, we don't have to be a passive responder anymore, we can take the initiative. The inquiry concluded that no one was to blame for the tragedy and that the events of that night were the result of water getting into the engine of the Union Star and, above all, the extreme severity of the weather. When the inquiry uh, results of the, or the findings of the inquiry came out, um, uh, my brother was exonerated and that really the cause of the tragedy was various small things that all added up to this big jigsaw. But at the end of the day, it was the sea that, that done them, no one else. When you live by the sea and you, you live with the sea, things happen. I mean, this is this is what, why we need lifeboats. You know, things like this happen. I mean, you can't blame anyone. That's, that's what you get living by the sea. I mean, every year there's there's probably 30, 40 fishermen lost every year around the British coast. For the 25th anniversary of that tragic night, Russell Smith has come over from America to pay his respects. My wife and I wanted to make a connection. And that's really the main reason we're back. Just to visit, say hello, say we care. And uh, say we'll never forget. Hello there, I'm Russ. You can't remember me. <laughs> Dudley? Yeah, Dudley. And Raymond? Which man at that time? Raymond Long We've met before. Yes, we have. Yes. Yes. Never forget. Never, ever, ever. And, you know, all my children now, I tell them about the story as well, you know, so. Because it is something which should never be forgotten. You know, the heroism and the. Uh, the brave deed on that night should always be remembered. Falmouth Coast Guard, Falmouth Coast Guard, Penny Lifeboat. Penny Lifeboat, Falmouth Coast Guard, go ahead over. Falmouth Coast Guard, Penny Lifeboat, yeah, for information, we're now leaving New England. The loss of the Solomon Brown didn't stop the people of Mausel maintaining the lifeboat tradition. Today, the Penley lifeboat is based a couple of miles from Mausel, in the fishing village of Newlyn. Neil Brockman, turned away by Trevelyan for being too young, is now the coxswain. I was asked by the RLI, first of the RLI, to become coxswain, and to start with, I didn't want to do it, because I thought I was too young. I was only 28 years old at the time, and I didn't think I was experienced enough or old enough to do the job. And they did beg me to, or really, persisted to ask me that to do it, so I said I would. So I said I would take it for 12 months to see how I got on. I've been here ever since. So. I've always thought Neil's the best man for the job anyway, because he's totally committed to his crew and they are on the line. 
I know he's you know, a very good friend of mine, but I'll always stand by that. As a, on a professional field, he's a, a, he's a hell of a coxswain. I've done every job on the boat, crewman, right up from crew to mechanic, coxswain mechanic, now full-blown coxswain with the mechanic. I mean, first, I think I got the best team in the RNLI, the best crew, but then everyone would say that any station you go, but I am lucky, I got a very experienced crew. Every one of my crew are seamen or ex-fishermen or they are actually, they're all to do with the sea. So I'm lucky in that, in that way. His father would have been very proud of him and he was very proud of his father and, and so it was a sort of public thing but also a private thing. It's just such an honour to, to, to know that they're carrying on in, in the tradition of the Royal Lifeboat Institute and that these people don't do it for money they do it for the, the giving, the volunteer work that gives life to other people, really. Because they still go out on rescues and assist other people in very difficult conditions all the time. Twenty-five years later, the old lifeboat station is empty. Kept exactly as it was in 1981, it stands as a memorial to the crew of the Solomon Brown. I just can't imagine how awful it must have been for them. Having a young daughter myself and, and uh, young children, it just must have been horrendous. And I can only imagine that they would, were just going to do everything they could. There's no way they could have said, oh, we can't. You know, it's too dangerous, we can't do this anymore, and just turn around and, and come back home. I mean, you know, it's just not something they would have done. I got no doubt in the back of my mind that if I'm on a shout on that lifeboat with six of my crew, there's eight other crewmen with me. No doubt about that whatsoever. They'll never be forgotten. I'm just proud that I sailed with them all. I do them all personally. <laughs>